Hi, Carl here for Pro V TV, and today we're taking a look at the Canon EOS R. Specifically, we're going through some of our recent tests on the camera because there were a few areas of the camera that we wanted to take a closer look at. Things like how it matches to some of the other cameras, autofocus performance, rolling shutter sharpness, areas like that. Because this is a camera I see talked about a huge amount online. And some of that is very, very positive indeed, particularly on my last video discussing it as a B camera to the C200. There were some fantastic comments on that and some people thought it did really, really well. But then I see a lot of negativity as well, specifically in those areas that I mentioned before. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna take a look at some of our tests, break it down a little bit and dissect a little what the strengths and what the weaknesses are of the camera. So what I've learned up first is some shots from our recent Blackmagic video. This was a video where we compared the little Blackmagic Pocket 4K to a bunch of other cameras. And so as part of that, we did the same shot and the same tests on a whole variety of cameras. So what I've done here is I've picked out the EOS R and the C200 from that test so that we can look at them next to each other. And the first thing that you notice is that the EOS R holds up really well. It's a little bit contrastier than the C200, but overall the colors look fantastic and I'm very, very happy with the image. High ISO is where the big surprise was for me. The EOS R is really clean. The noise looks great at 6400. The colors look fantastic. I re was really, really surprised and impressed by just how well it did here. Considering it's a smaller camera and it crops into a sensor, I was really quite impressed. The C200 looks a little bit noisier in RAW, as you'd expect, because it's not doing any noise reduction in camera. And the MP4 looks great, just as good, to be honest, as the EOS R does. But I was expecting the EOS R to come off a little worse there. In overexposure and underexposure, the EOS R does suffer a little bit of overexposure because it doesn't have quite as much dynamic range as the C200 and um, it has an older log curve of the original Canon log, which doesn't have nearly as much dynamic range. It's not quite as flat. That's why the image overall looks a little contrastier, and it's why we're missing out on some highlight exposure here in the plus three stops. You can see the table behind her. It's clipping, and we've lost a little bit of information there on her forehead. On underexposure, though, it actually does better than the C200 at MP4. You can see on the MP4 there on the C200, it is breaking apart a little bit. We've got large blocks of color noise, and we don't get that anywhere near as much on the EOS R, even though we were using the 8-bit internal recording on the camera. And I think this is a large part of why this happened is because of the original Canon log. Yes, it's not as good a log curve, it's not as flat, it doesn't have as much dynamic range, but the reason it isn't as flat and the reason it doesn't have as much dynamic range is because it's designed for an 8-bit workflow for less intensive post-production. Whereas with the C200, we were using C-Log3, which of course needs a lot more grading to it. And so that is, I think, why that it fell apart there in the shadows, whereas the EOS R didn't. I think it's purely down to the log curve we were using. Crop factor is probably the thing that's talked about the most with the EOS R because it is a full frame camera and in 1080p it's a full frame video camera. But in 4K it jumps into that 1.7 times crop. So what I've done here is I put it next to the C200 with the same frame shot and the same lens on it, the same focal length, and just changed between the modes so that we can see the difference in focal length that comes with that crop factor. So first up, we've got the C200. This is Super 35 that we're all used to using. Then this is 1080p on the EOS R, and this is that full frame image that we're talking about. Notice it's a huge amount wider. And now this is that 1.7 times 4K crop. Now this is a lot more closer to the C200. It is a bit tighter. It's definitely further cropped in than the C200 is. But in terms of day-to-day -day use, they work out about the same. The main weakness of the EOS R for video work, in my opinion, is definitely its rolling shutter performance or sensor readout. We did a test here comparing both the 1080p and the 4K to the C200 and the Sony A7R Mark III as a bit of a mirrorless competition. And it definitely performed worse than both of those cameras. You can see here in 1080p and particularly in 4K, there is some very definitely noticeable rolling shutter. 
The C200 actually performs really, really well. I've got no problems there whatsoever. And the A7R Mark III, there is some, but it's not as bad as the EOS R. Whether or not this is a problem for you and your work, only you can really tell that. Um, but this is definitely the main negative of the camera for video performance, in my opinion. The next thing I wanted to test was sharpness, because this is something I've seen people talking about more and more over the last few months, and I've seen a few videos popping up where it shows that EOS R is being significantly softer than some of its competition. And that confused me a little bit because it hasn't been my experience with the camera whatsoever. And so I wanted to de delve in a little bit here, a little deeper, and compare it to some other cameras and see if we can get to the bottom of this. Before we get onto that though, I noticed that within the Canon log settings on the EOS R, you actually get the option to add in sharpness, add sharpness in camera. Now, Every little mirrorless camera like this is adding sharpness, of course, even the zero on most of them is still adding sharpness. And on some other cameras, you can take away sharpness. Here, you can't. It starts on zero at default, and then you can add up to seven amounts of sharpness. Now, sometimes it's better to do sharpness in post. Sometimes it's better to do it in camera. It's always doing a little bit in camera. And so I thought, what I thought we'd do is we'd do a little bit of a test here and put some side-by-side -side comparisons of the different sharpness levels so that we can narrow down which one might be the best. And so what I've got here is I've got a split screen. This is 1080p. We've got zero sharpness on the bottom left, 4K as a reference on the bottom right, and then one sharpness, two sharpness, three, and four. Above four, it really does get unusable. It gets far too digitally um, mushy. Um, to be honest, I think three and four look pretty bad as well. Two is starting to get that way, but you could possibly get away with two. But one, I think, actually looks really good here. It really makes that 1080p pop. It gets significantly more detailed than it with zero sharpness applied and actually looks nearly as sharp as the 4K. It's not as sharp as the 4K. You definitely can't see that fine detail in the bush there. But in terms of a general impression, it looks pretty good. Bear in mind, all of these have quite significantly cropped into the image. This is a side-by-side -side with zero sharpness on the left with some sharpness added in post and one sharpness done in camera on the right. And actually, it brings it to about the same level of detail. But the problem with sharpening in post is that if there's any noise at all in the image, and because this is a log footage, there is some noise, of course, in those shadows areas, it tends to sharpen that noise as well. And so as we can see in some of the bokeh here behind the bush, the noise is slightly more obvious on the version on the left than it is on the right. And so because of that, I think actually the one sharpness added in camera is doing a better job here for 1080p than zero sharpness with a little bit added in post. And so I want to do a little bit more testing on this, but it's certainly looking at the moment like I'd encourage people to add one level of sharpness in camera when you're in 1080p. So let's have a look at 4K. On the bottom right for reference this time, we've got the C200, and then we've got 4K with zero sharpness on the left, one, two, three, and four working our way up the image. And again, as we can see, three and four really overdone a little bit. And two, again, is getting that way. But one looks pretty good. It, I think it's the same situation here in 4K as it was in 1080p. There's a big leap between zero and one in camera. And actually, compared, comparing the 4K with zero to the C200, the C200 is slightly more detailed. But then once you add one sharpness there, I think it pops even more than the C200 does. It's definitely comparable. Here we've got the same sort of test. We've got zero sharpness with some sharpness added in post on the left and one sharpness done in camera on the right. And as you can see, it's exactly the same situation. But actually here, I think the in-camera sharpening is doing an even better job in the detail. Some of the detail looks a little more fine and less plasticky than it does with the sharpness added in post. And of course, you've got the noise in the bokeh in the background. And so from these tests, I think I'm gonna be adding one level of sharpness in camera. So here we've done some tests to see if it's exactly the same situation when you're sending a 4K signal out over the 1080p. 
um, out over the HDMI port into an Atmos. And I think it's about the same. I don't notice much difference here whatsoever. It's much of the same situation here. And what we've got here is we've got 4K external with zero sharpness on the left and 4K internal with zero sharpness on the right to see if there, there is any natural advantage of taking a 10-bit signal out over the HDMI versus recording 8-bit internally in terms of sharpness. And to me, these look identical. The gamma is a little bit different, some of the colors different and the contrast is different, as you'd expect. But in terms of detail and sharpness, they look about the same to me. Now here, I've compared it to the other cameras. So we've got the C200 in the bottom left, we've got the A7R Mark III from Sony in the top left, and then we've got 4K external and 4K internal with zero sharpness applied on the right, on the EOS R. Now, obviously you notice the depth of field straight away, the A7R Mark III, because it's using a full frame sensor, is a lot shallower in the background. So you've got to take that into, comparison, into consideration. You've got to compare the areas of the bush that are in focus here. But actually, even with zero sharpness on the EOS R, I think they're pretty comparable. The C200 has got the most detail here, but I'd say these are comparable to the Sony. And then once you add one sharpness level like here, I'd say they're now comparable to the C200 and beat the Sony. So the last test we're gonna look at today is autofocus. The main things I wanted to look at here is if you're using the EOS R with native RF lenses, is that going to be better autofocus performance than if you're using it with the EF adapter and EF mount lenses? Or is it gonna be exactly the same? And is the EOS R just as good as the C200 when it comes to autofocus performance? So first up here, we've got the EOS R with an EF lens. So this is the 24 to 70 f2.8 from Canon, and it's using their normal EF to R adapter. And as you can see, it, it pulls focus very well as I walk towards it. It's doing a great job of tracking my face, and it snaps from the background to my face very quickly. This is the biggest difference that I see between the EOS R and the C200. The EOS R seems to have a lot less control in it for how quickly or slowly you want that move to be in focus. And just overall, it seems a lot more find out what has to be in focus and snap to it, rather than the C200, which is a little bit more smooth and cinematic. But as we move over to RF lenses here, to me, these look about the same. I see very little difference here in terms of autofocus performance. It's certainly nothing to be worried about. I think this is gonna be a big relief for people who want to use their existing EF glass with the EOS R. Now this is the C200 with plus one and plus three in the speed and response settings. This is what we normally have the camera set to on this channel because I want it to snap to my face pretty quickly if it ever loses me. I'm not moving around too much after all. And as you can see here, it's doing a great job of tracking my face and it's moving very slowly and naturally between the background and my face when it identifies that it wants to focus on my face. But interestingly, the EOS R was actually doing a better job of identifying my face and tracking it. And this is definitely something I noticed when I was shooting with it in low light situations back at the launch of the EOS R, was that the C200 we were doing the behind the scenes on was struggling in some situations in the low light and the EOS R was absolutely rock solid. And so I think the C200, the EOS R even, is a better autofocus system that's more reliable but I prefer the way that the C200 moves. Even here with default autofocus settings, it's very smooth to move between different focus subjects. So hopefully you found those tests useful. I know I did. I certainly wasn't expecting that I'd be advising anybody to add sharpness in camera. That definitely caught me by surprise. And I'm sure this is a video that is going to be generating a lot of discussion down in the comment section. So make sure you leave a comment down there and let me know what you thought of these tests. Is there anything else you want me to take a closer look at, maybe do in a different way? Let me know in the comment section down below. Let me know your thoughts. And of course, if you want to buy one of these for yourself, the link to our website is in the description. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Thank you.